Joint military drills and huge business deals. Russia and China are boosting up their relationship. But are they building an alliance? Can they trust each other? And what do the U.S. and its allies think? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Hoda Abdelhamid. With a firm handshake, the presidents of China and Russia have announced stronger ties. Vladimir Putin is hosting Xi Jinping, as well as the Japanese and South Korean leaders, at the three-day Eastern Economic Forum in Vladivostok. It aims to boost investment in the Far East region of Asia, but Putin is warning trade barriers are a threat to Asian economies. As the world's top two economies, the US and China, impose trade tariffs on each other. As the talks began, so did the largest war games by Chinese and Russian troops since the Soviet Union. 300,000 troops, 36,000 tanks and armored vehicles, and 1,000 warplanes and ships are all on parade in Siberia. And from the fire into the frying pan, as Putin introduces Xi to Russian cooking, Rory Challenge takes a look at how the countries are strengthening bilateral ties. With the slight awkwardness of two leaders who probably don't spend much time in the kitchen, Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin conducted some pancake diplomacy in Vladivostok. The Chinese president is here for the Eastern Economic Forum and his third meeting with Putin this year. Despite the presence of other Asian leaders, it's Russia and China's strengthening ties that are the bedrock of this event. And with caviar and vodka, the two presidents were happy to let the world know how close they've become. We were constantly meeting this year, for example in Beijing, in Johannesburg, and now here we are in Vladivostok. If we keep close contact with you, it means we have good relations. I am ready to strengthen these relations from now on, including the exchange of ideas through close cooperation. China has the largest delegation with almost a thousand people. It is quite clear we have a really close cooperation. We had $87 billion of trade last year. This year, we will almost certainly reach $100 billion. The cooperation makes sense. The two Eurasian giants are next-door neighbors, and China's hungry economy needs natural resources, which Russia has in abundance. This growing relationship is about more than just the kind of business and energy deals on offer here at the Eastern Economic Forum. It's about the threats that both Russia and China feel they share in the modern world. While Xi Jinping and Putin were talking, the heavy metal of Russia's military was moving into place, China's too. It's been invited to take part in Vostok 2018, Russia's biggest war game since 1981. A sign of friendship and a message to one particular adversary. Clearly we can see uh, continued um, uh, rapprochement uh, between Russia and China because of uh, a very assertive line uh, of the United States. Uh, against both countries. And in this regard, we can, we can um, uh, say that uh, Donald Trump uh, is the major patron of uh, Russian-Chinese uh, uh, closer relationship. Washington has imposed sanctions on Russia and trade tariffs on China. Each country is too independent-minded to make a full alliance at all likely, but they still want the US to know that if a regional crisis ever exploded into conflict, Russia and China could present a united front. Rory Challenge, Al Jazeera, Vladivostok. So let's bring in our panel. Joining us in Moscow, Pavel Felgenhauer, Russian military analyst. From Beijing, Michael Kovrig. He's a senior advisor for Northeast Asia at the International Crisis Group. And from Washington, D.C., Michael Purcell, director of operations at the Center for Global Interests. Uh, gentlemen, welcome to the program. Um, Pavel, let me start with you. Uh, we are seeing strong pictures coming out of Siberia. What is the main message here? Uh, well, these um, um, exercises or actually war games happening in the Russian Far East, 
are really a big deal. There's a lot of Russian troops being mobilized and moved forward. It's happening from the Arctic uh, to in the Pacific and in the uh, uh, Far East and partially in Siberia. Uh, but the main ground action is going to happen in the uh, Transbaikal or Zak Baikalia region, which is actually north of the Chinese border. Russian um, exercises happen there on a regular basis, and always before they had a bit of a kind of overtone that this could be also partially to uh, be prepared for a possible clash with Ru China. And so this time, for there to be no kind of speculations on that, the Russian military invited the Chinese contingent to take part, also contingent, small contingent from Mongolia. So a Chinese um, brigade-sized force, over 3,000 men with about 30 aircraft, have been deployed there together with the Russian troops. At one specific point, this is a very big war game, but at one specific point, at one training range in Tsugu, and there, there's about 25,000 Russians and 3,000 Chinese. And there, there's going to be the climax of the action. Putin is going to be there at the climax this week and to see all the fireworks. And most likely, there's going to be a Chinese delegation, too. And so there's the Russians and the Chinese as brothers in arms preparing to fight alongside each other against uh, foreign foe, which most likely means America and its allies, and the political leadership overseeing that happening. So this is all very significant. Well, Michael, is, the, is it the same view in China? I mean, the, Beijing has something at stake here. What exactly is the message China is trying to send to the world? Uh, thank you. So this is absolutely, uh, I fully agree with our colleague, it's a strong message from President Xi Jinping, both to have these large military exercises and have Chinese troops participating in them for the first time ever. That's really quite significant. Uh, China and Russia have done military exercises before together, of course, but not within Russian soil and not at this scale. Uh, so that sends a very strong message of increasing military cooperation that has really been growing strongly under President Xi and President Putin for the past several years, and then has accelerated under the Trump administration's policies for the United States. And secondly, you have uh, President Xi turning up at the uh, economic forum in Vladivostok, again, the first time a Chinese leader has attended that forum, a very strong display of diplomatic support and of respect for President Putin, re reciprocating his, Putin's visit to Beijing in uh, June of this year. And that's three visits, uh, three meetings that the two leaders have had this year, again, marking an acceleration over the last several years, really since Xi Jinping came into power and found a kindred spirit in Vladimir Putin, uh, building on econo economic complementarities, uh, military cooperation prospects, but also very much by uh, the t challenges that both countries are having with the United States. Uh, and this uh, we get th these two meetings here uh, and uh, the military cooperation are a very strong signal to the United States that if it continues to put this kind of pressure on either of them, it's going to push them even closer together. Well, Michael, I I'm supposing that while these uh, war games are happening, uh, generals, military experts are looking, uh, are watching very closely uh, what's happening, the scale, what kind of equipment is on display. But what are they looking for exactly? Uh, <clears throat> I think the uh, probably the most important uh, indicator that uh, military analysts are looking for is the degree to which uh, real capability is demonstrated in the sense that uh, combined military operations and, and, and a capability to conduct combined military operations is something that the, the Russian and Chinese uh, would attempt to demonstrate. I think, uh, you know, a quick look would, would tell you that the signaling is, as Michael and uh, Pavel have described, uh, more on a strategic uh, political level to demonstrate resolve, if you will, and a willingness to cooperate. That's a far cry from an alliance, uh, which is, uh, you know, what the U.S.'s uh, participation in the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, NATO, over so many years and at the moment is, is a bit contentious, but nonetheless still strong. Uh, the level of cooperation entailed in an alliance is significantly more than that what we're seeing in, uh, in this exercise, Vostok uh, 2018. Well, uh, Michael Kovrig, it is 
I mean, China is the first time that it, uh, let's say, goes and trains outside of its borders. Relations with Russia have never, have not, not always been uh, so friendly. Is this more of a marriage of convenience uh, as they sit and watch uh, things unfolding in Washington? I think it, you could argue that it started out that way several years ago. Uh, China-Russia relations, certainly on the economic side, uh, for a long time were relatively modest, certainly much, much less than the huge bilateral trade relationship between China and the United States, uh, or even China and Europe. But ever since uh, the Russian annexation of Crimea and worsening relations between Russia and Europe and Russia and the United States and sanctions on Russia, that's really pushed uh, Russians in particular to look further east, something they've done reluctantly, gradually over time. Uh, and the Chinese have welcomed that. But again, there's also been a lot of mutual suspicion uh, from the Chinese side as well. So what we're really seeing is geopolitical circumstances driving these two political leaders to move their country closer together. And a lot of that has started with top-level political rhetoric and language, lots of leader-level meetings. But step by step, it is being underpinned by initiatives. Uh, the two have agreed, for example, after a lot of debate uh, and concern, that their two, uh, the Eurasian Economic Union and the Silk Road Economic Belt initiatives in Central Asia, they would try to make them cooperate and work together. We've seen increasing cooperation and investment uh, in, through Central Asia, and uh, particularly building on the energy relationship. And then from China's perspective, the military cooperation is very important, not only in this kind of exercise and training, but also in uh, Chinese interest, at least in the short term, in Russian military technology, specifically uh, cutting-edge uh, surface-to-air missile batteries and uh, Sukhoi fourth-generation fighter jets, which China still doesn't have a domestic capacity to build. And that starts to affect the strategic balance then between China and the United States and other powers uh, in the Pacific Ocean as well. Well, um, Pavel, in, apart from the message uh, that China and Russia are getting uh, closer together, I think also the dynamic has a bit changed between these two countries, I mean, in the sense that uh, Russia, the Soviet Union, used to be the big bear, and now is, is China the big bear because of, this, of its, its economic strength. But beyond that, I saw you uh, quoted as saying that this is about sending a message that soon there will be a large-scale conflict. Uh, well, the Russian military, the Russian general staff, since officially at least till 13, have uh, not only put forward, but this has been approved by the Kremlin, a threat assessment that predicts uh, uh, an accelerating uh, possibility of a big war happening somewhere in the 20s, uh, a, a series or several uh, uh, large-scale regional wars that may actually in the, uh, escalate into a global conflict. And the Russian, and this is, that's the official political uh, perspective. That's what the Russian military and Russian state have been preparing, and these exercises is a demonstration and a test of the Russian capability to mobilize and field a large numbers of uh, heavily armed troops for a regional, ma massive regional war that could happen in the East, in Asia, or in the West, in Europe, and the co capability to move these forces long distance uh, to East or West, because the Russian present military is much smaller than the Soviet military, so it relies on mobility, and to sustain such forces in the field, have a good logistics operation, and see See where the uh, uh, weak uh, spots are. These exercises should expose them. So this is, yes, this is uh, testing and preparing for a possible big regional war that could happen in the future or may not happen, and also to use this as a signal and as a deterrent to demonstrate to the potential opponents, which are basically seen as sitting in Washington, that Russia is ready to fight for and defend its uh, borders, and that it has a strong ally in China, at least, that Russia is not without allies, and
understand that this is uh, maybe uh, dealing with Russia is not that good an idea and that the United States should think twice before taking on Russia. Well, talking about the United States, let's go to Michael Purcell. I mean, when asked about this, uh, the U.S. Secretary of Defense, Jim Mattis, said, I think that nations are, act out of their interest. I see little in the long term that aligns Russia and China uh, together. Now, do you think that is a good read from uh, the Pentagon? I mean, we have seen a China that has been modernizing and reforming its military uh, with quite intensity over the past few years. Shouldn't they be a little bit more worried? And I think it is a good read from, from uh, Secretary Mattis, and it's consistent with uh, what he's portrayed as his worldview. Uh, the, the U.S. national security documents, the national security strategy, defense strategies, both identify um, China and Russia as strategic competitors. Uh, and that's not just in the military realm, but of course in the political and, and economic realm as well. Uh, I, I, would, I would say General, the Secretary Mattis uh, is probably careful not to over-militarize uh, the entire relationship between Russia and China. Uh, I think we should be careful, and I know he would say this as well, uh, to use the word allies. Uh, a formal alliance implies uh, an obligation for mutual defense in, in, the, in the Article 5 of the NATO Treaty. Um, it talks about uh, attack on one is an attack on all. And, and, and I think it's important we identify and be careful with that word, that this is not an alliance, this is a strategic partnership between Russia and China. Um, and I think Secretary Mattis also knows that uh, the, uh, the values gap, if you will, between the, the U.S. perspective on the relationship and uh, with Russia and China and, and their relationship is one such that both Russia and China at the moment have authoritarian uh, uh, characteristics of their, their, their ruling uh, governments and uh, the U.S. Uh, is clear to point that out as being inconsistent with uh, what it sees as as sort of the international order, and that's that's bound to be conflict. So I, I think he uh, uh, probably has this in the right perspective and context. But Michael Kovrig, I mean, since uh, Chairman Xi came to power, certainly the uh, China concentrated a lot on modernizing its military. Uh, I think there's a special focus on the navy, if I'm not wrong. That has somehow tilted the balance of power uh, in the Pacific area, no? That's correct, yes. President Xi has uh, strongly prioritized reforming the People's Liberation Army and turning it from what was frankly a large economic enterprise uh, and heavily based, uh, dominated by a land army and shifted a lot of the investment and the training and the technological improvement to the Navy and the Air Force, really wanting to turn it with the, with the objective of turning it by 2035 into a modern, competent fighting force and by 2050 into a really world-class world military. And that's involved an enormous program of building ships and, of course, uh, then uh, reclaiming and paving on and militarizing islands in the South China Sea, establishing an air defense identification zone in the East China Sea. And essentially what we're seeing from China and uh, in its own way from Russia are attempts for both of these countries to establish spheres of influence uh, in their peripheries. China wants to push the U.S. Navy and the U.S. military influence and role in East Asia further away from its shores to establish within the Western Pacific and certainly within the first island chain uh, that's demarcated by Japan, for example, and other islands out there, a zone in which China is the dominant power. It's not looking for a fight. It's nowhere near ready for an actual conflict with the United States. It doesn't want that. But what it does want to do is enlarge its space for maneuver, uh, for example, condition uh, other countries in the region to be more deferential to Chinese preferences, protect its sea lines of communication, and reestablish itself as a dominant regional power. And in that sense, with its relations with Russia, it's found a, a willing partner, if a reluctant one in some ways. But increasingly, U.S. policies that have put pressure on both countries have led them to find a kind of axis of convenience uh, and mutual benefits. Uh, for example, now trade tariffs applied by the U.S. on China, similarly to sanctions on Russia, incentivize them to look for stronger economic ties, stronger defense ties, and stronger political ties. Uh, that's not an inevitable process, but as long as that pressure is there from the U.S., they're going to keep looking for, to each other for support, whether political or otherwise. And, and I'm just going to bring back Michael uh, Purcell. So just in view of what we just heard, and this... Uh, Chinese military that is getting uh, modernized, stronger, it, 
there was a time where it was considered like a second string kind of military. Is that still the case in Washington? And certainly with having more capabilities with these uh, missiles that they're developing, uh, that must challenge the U.S. supremacy in parts of the Pacific. I think the short answer to that question is, is yes. It is, uh, you use the word worried, as Secretary Mattis worried about, in particular, the U.S., or rather the Russia-China relationship. I think concern is what, a, you know, a, a military officer like General Mattis, uh, now Secretary, would, would use. But yes, concern, because the capabilities that, that China has demonstrated over uh, the preceding several years are significant, and they're, they're a change to the nature of their, their ability to project power uh, in, outside of the borders of, of China. And uh, the U.S. has, uh, both militarily and, uh, I think, strategically, uh, adjusted itself to a future that must accommodate uh, Chinese military power in the, in the first ranks, if you will. Okay, and Pavel, now, this is all happening on the backdrop of the Ukraine crisis, uh, the war in Syria, allegations that Russia is interfering in uh, Western elections and politics. So I'm sure there is a message that President Putin is trying uh, to convey here by holding the largest military exercises in its history or is in modern history? Uh, well, of course, these processes are happening in the West and in the Southwest, and the exercises are in the Far East. There is, of course, uh, a kind of uh, tense situation still somewhat in the Korean Peninsula, but there has been a downscaling of tensions there just recently. Uh, but the actual planning of this exercise happened some time before. It's a big strategic exercise, and it's also a war game, actually. And there's a difference between exercise and war game. Uh, the, and the, so this is um, there's technicalities there involved, because in the European part of Russia, there is the Vienna document of the OECE that limits the possibility of large scale like that mobilizations. And in the, in the Far East, uh, there's only very limited regulations. There's an agreement with China on a, a kind of limited limiting forces in the immediate border area. But most of these exercises are happening outside of that. So that's a free zone. And at the same time, Russia has invited the Russian military have in, uh, invited uh, journalists and uh, observers from accredited uh, uh, military attaches here in Moscow to go. Well, they're going to go to the Tsugo. That's just one piece of the action where there's going to be a showcase for President Putin and other dignitaries. So, of course, they won't see much of the real nitty gritty of how Russia is dealing with uh, deploying such large numbers of troops. R uh, the Russian uh, general staff has announced that right now we have 126 uh, battle ready immediate but already tactical battalion groups in our military, in the Army, in the Marines, and the Airborne Corps, whereas NATO, say, deployed again to contain Russia four battalion tactical groups in the, um, the Baltics and in Poland. So the difference is, of course, in Russian, on the Russian side, though there is, of course, a technological still gap between the Russian military and the Western militaries, uh, though, of course, the Russian battle readiness has increased. Everyone recognizes that. And you should also take into account okay. that the Russian military want to have a good uh, kind of, they uh, want to uh, keep uh, up some uh, kind I'm of sorry to tension you with the West. Because we're reaching the end, but I just want to ask a last question briefly, Michael Purcell. In view of what we just heard, yes, there is still a technological gap, but I think in Washington, people will probably keep on watching closely at how quickly that gap is bridged, right? I think that's accurate, and it's 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 not hard to look back uh, in the in the just a few years ago when Russian military capability wasn't taken nearly as seriously at the strategic level. And what Pavel's described, the nuts and bolts of this exercise, uh, is, it was very well done. I mean, it's it's a, it's an opportunity to examine uh, weaknesses and make fixes, but also to demonstrate at that level that they have the capability to uh, to again, you know, occupy the first ranks. And uh, it's a uh, certainly a, a point well taken in Washington, I think. Well, so far, we haven't tested really the combat capabilities of the Chinese, but we have reached the end of this program. I'm sure we'll be talking about it in the future. Thanks to all our guests.
Pavel Felkenhauer, Michael Kovrick and Michael Purcell. And thank you too for watching. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website aljazeera.com and for further discussion go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Hud Abdul Hamid and the whole team here in Doha. Bye for now.